trained at Michigan State and was then at Cornell and a student of Hazen Gray. He was also, incidentally, one of the first to cite Mendel in 1865. Um, and in the 1895 address on de Vanier's book, he, he said, the horticulturalist is the only man in the world whose distinct business and profession is evolution. He, of all other men, has the experimental proof that species come and go. And this was picked up. In 1896, at the Illinois State Agricultural Lab, there was begun a corn breeding experiment for high and low varieties of corn. This is still an ongoing experiment, and it actually constitutes the longest running intentional evolution experiment. And they observed rapid and massive responses to selection. And this inspired others as time went on, and it became the first of many selection and breeding experiments with plants, livestock, animals, and Drosophila in the early 20th century by figures like Hugo de Vries, Theodosius Stojansky, Sewell Wright, and many others. The results of these experiments <coughs> the data that fed into the development of the modern synthesis that began with the integration of Darwinism and alien genetics by Fisher, Haldane, and Wright, and then proceeded from there, ultimately culminating in a central concept that Ernst Meyer described as Gradual evolution can be explained in terms of small genetic changes or mutations and recombination. And the ordering of this genetic variation by natural selection. They observed evolutionary phenomena, particularly macroevolutionary processes and speciation, can be explained in a manner that is consistent with the known genetic mechanisms. <coughs> this was nothing less than, than the conceptual unification of biology at multiple levels. And as such unifications do, it provided the tools necessary to look anew at the biological world and ask new questions, posing the hypotheses. And it um, led the Jansky and others uh, to really use it as a foundation to go forward and develop evolution into a truly modern, empirically based and experimental field. And these new ways of approaching biology in the biological world seeped outward in, from the disciplines originally covered to the, under the synthesis into others, including ecology. This was also concurrent with the rise and increased appreciation for statistics, the origin of modeling and computer simulation. And there were beginning to be inklings of recognition among evolutionary biologists that there were kind of needed uh, lab systems with which to study evolution. The microbes, of course, would seem to hold promise as the perfect lab system, and in fact, there were already examples. In 1932, Gauss published The Struggle for Existence, in which he proposed the competitive exclusion hypothesis based on experiments he had done with pieces of paramecia. But many were still suspicious, particularly of bacteria. They seemed to be too different. To evolve by Lamarckian uh, means, it seemed that whenever they were exposed to some selective agent, they would somehow evolve very rapidly, almost too rapidly, to deal with them. Uh, so clearly, they seem to be different, and in fact, Julian Huxley somewhat famously and notoriously wrote in 1943, bacteria have no genes. <laughs> that occasional mutation has occurred, we know, but there is no ground for supposing that they are similar in nature to those of higher organism, nor that they play the same part in evolution. We must, in fact, expect that the processes of variation, heredity, and evolution in bacteria are quite different the corresponding processes in multicellular organisms. There were, of course, those who were more prescient. Theodosius Dubchansky himself in 1941 wrote, although some bacteriologists are prone to believe that the behavior of bacteria is incompatible with established concepts of genetics and evolutionary theory, there are valid reasons to think that bacteria may prove to be the best available materials for exact studies of mutation and natural selection. Because prescient indeed, because at approximately the same time, there were two fellows uh, uh, undertaking really critical work. S.E. Lurie and Max Delbruck were, in fact, going after this issue of whether or not bacteria, in fact, evolved by Darwinian means. And they did this by carrying out an experiment that was inspired by the <coughs> observation of a slot machine at a faculty dance at the University of Indiana, which I wonder what that dance was like. <laughs> and it resulted in a 1943 paper uh, mutation of bacteria from virus sensitivity to virus resistance that is an absolute classic. One that Rich himself has called uh, espousing the single greatest experiment in the history of biology. And in this, they carefully thought out the possible outcomes if they were to plate replicate E. coli uh, cultures with HT1. 
if mutations were induced by exposure to selective agents, then they would expect to see roughly equal numbers of resistant mutants across all replicants. But if mutations were spontaneously arising regardless of selection, then they should see a variation, a great variation between the replicants due to the differences in when during the outgrowth of the culture the resistance mutation took place. If it occurred very early on, you'd see a huge number of uh, resistant colonies, a jackpot. And the results that they observed were exactly in line with the distributions they predicted under the spontaneous mutation model. The importance of this experiment and paper cannot be underplayed or overplayed. It ended up winning Lurie the Nobel and Nobel Prize, and it had massive ramifications. It showed that bacteria are not different, but in fact evolve like everything else. It introduced the world to the fluctuation test that we still use, even so you can do it before you kill yourselves. <laughs> um, it provided a model for really incredible experimental elegance and that was guided by sharply drawn hypotheses, the way science really should be done. And it demonstrated that mutations for the first time in bacteria and other organisms are in fact random and spontaneous with regard to selective forces. Um, moreover, it showed that bacteria were in fact living thing, uh, uh, respectable living things amenable to study. Uh, Rich did not in fact say that. Uh, <laughs> I ran out of quotes. <laughs> And it set the stage for the use of bacteria in building molecular biology. And enormous progress was then made with bacteria in this field. It, it led to the elucidation of the genetic code, of DNA replication translation, gene regulation, viral genetics, and life cycle. And it led to the development of a great number of very powerful techniques. Many researchers also gained great familiarity with working with bacteria. And work, of course, leads to more work. The star of uh, much of this time was, of course, E. coli. And um, Jacques Minot kind of encapsulated the spirit of the time with the, with, when he said, anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephants. And if this is true of molecular biology, as he meant it, then surely it's true of ecology and evolution, too. And in fact, Minot uh, uh, aided in the development of, of this current. Uh, he uh, developed the chemostat in the 1940s, originally to study continuous growth and dioxin shift, but he recognized that there was some other potential. Writing, without a doubt, the technique of continuous culture will find applications in the analysis of mutability. We cannot disregard factors of selection. And sure enough, by the early 1950s, there were researchers who were looking at adaptation during prolonged culture, producing a, a number of classic papers. And so, some evolutionary biologists began to wake to the idea that, you know, these microbes are really great. They would be good for studying evolution. After all, they have rapid generation time. So they evolve quickly. They can maintain large population size, lots of variability, can have incredible control of conditions. You can control everything about them in ways you can't with natural systems like zebras. And you can freeze the samples and they stay viable, something you really can't do with zebras. Um, and, it, uh, and they also noted the growing wealth of sophisticated genetic tools that could be applied to the analysis of evolved changes. So by the late 1960s and early 70s, some uh, even began to understand <coughs> studies of evolutionary phenomena using microbes as models. And much of this work was done with bacteria and phase dynamics. One of the early adopters was Bruce Levin, who thankfully just walked in. Uh, he was an ecological geneticist who was working with Drosophila, and, but he wanted to pursue questions at the border of population genetics and the genetic basis of evolution, something that wasn't really possible at the time with Drosophila. So with the help of Seymour uh, Lederberg and Mark Rothman at Brown University, he switched to E. coli, despite some good-natured joshing by Bobjansky, um, and Lederberg even gave him a strain of E. coli to work with, one that became famous down the road for various reasons. Uh, his first paper, which he rapidly produced, uh, described niche partitioning and the coexistence of distinct lineages in an environment with a single resource. It became an instant classic, a real proof of concept of this approach. Then, in 1977, with his colleague Frank uh, Stewart and his grad student Lin Chow, he produced a groundbreaking paper in which 
there was presented a model of predator-prey interactions um, in a resource-limited ecosystem. They then examined these predictions using computer simulations and then backed up those by doing wet lab hemostat work in the line of HT2. This paper later piqued the interest of a grad student in North Carolina who sat down and wrote and, write, and, and wrote through some letter. This letter was, of course, signed Rich Lenski. So, who is this Rich Lenski? Where did he come from? Well, he sprang fully bearded from the brow. <laughs> Sometimes the 1870s were uncertain. The records have been lost. He taught Meyer how to bird watch, Fisher how to count. He wandered in the wilderness for many years. He gathered the beetles together long before Ed Sullivan, and may have taught them how to play instruments. He taught and cavorted with gods, ones of cool, ones of darkness, ones of light, and even fairy queens. He then created E. coli and used them to end the eclipse of Darwinism, taught them tricks like eating oranges, and started the Great Experiment, built the LT Fortress, and appointed the first priests and priestesses of the Order of the Hegelai to watch over. <laughs> or at least so go the legends that arose in the centuries after the Great Squirrel Wars that collapsed civilization, except for the long-term evolution experiment, some 10,000 years from now. Ironically, Rich himself is partly responsible for this war, as he saved the distant ancestor of the Squirrel Messiah who led the uprising. <laughs> but we live in the distant past, and we have records of where he came from. And there is no truth to the fact that he is a product of a long-term Illuminati project to bring super genius. Though really, in researching his family, he might as well have been. This was incredibly humbling. Before I go into this, I just want to note for the record, of my four great-grandfathers, two were farmers, one was a mechanic, and one was a traveling salesman. My most noteworthy great-aunt was Rena, who was a great fisherwoman, and Stories are still told about how she once uh, chased the great uncle Chap out of the house with a shotgun, and she decided it was time for a divorce. <laughs> so, that said, <laughs> Rich's great grandfather was a man named Richard Charles Henry Linsky, who was born in Prussia and came to America where he married a school teacher named Marietta Young. And they settled in Ohio. He was a highly regarded conservative Lutheran minister, scholar, and theologian who wrote a magnum opus that was a 12-volume, 12,000-page commentary on the New Testament that included his own de novo translation of the entire text from the original Greek. You can still buy this. It's $200 on Amazon, where it has a five-star rating based on 13 reviews that people actually wrote things on. So sell your shirt and buy Linsky. His writing style can be characterized as concise and precise. <laughs> Solid and extremely quotable. And my favorite, I would not feel properly armed as an evangelical pastor. <laughs> But she was a poet, a writer, and an illustrator of children's and young adult novels. She wrote over a hundred herself and illustrated several hundred others, so many that there's not even a good number on how many. No one knows. She won the 1946 Newbery Award for Strawberry Girl and was runner-up in 1937 and 1942. His grandfather was Gerhard Emanuel Linsky Sr who, like his father before him, was a minister and theologian and writer as well as a historian. He served as a Navy chaplain in World War I before becoming pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in D.C. for 32 years. He retired from that uh, after he earned a Ph.D. in history and decided on a second career uh, as a professor of systematic theology at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley. He then retired from that at age 8. Rich's father was Gerhard or Gary Emanuel Kaplinsky Jr., who uh, developed early and intense intellectual passions, and his father at the dinner table imbued him with a deep social conscience that really played out throughout his life. He was an undergraduate student at Yale and then went into World War II to serve as a photographer in England, an experience that he later noted 
uh, allowed him to interact with people of different backgrounds and cultures, but it profoundly impacted him and really steered him toward his life's work. In 1947, he returned to Yale under the GI Bill to study sociology. And in 1948, he married Richard's mother, Jean Kappelman, a young woman who was a congregant in his father's church, and the daughter of another congregate, Emer Kappelman, who's a well-regarded architect who even uh, designed part of uh, Rich's father's uh, grandfather's <coughs> church, though it was built after wow. Uh, he's notable, and in fact, houses on the market that he designed still know him. So his, his is a name that carries weight. Gerhardt became an incredibly significant contributor to sociology. First uh, teaching at the University of Michigan, where he did research in Detroit, and then at UNC Chapel Hill, where he completed his career. He made significant and ongoing contributions to the fields of sociology and religion, social stratification and uh, inequality, and most significantly, comparative macro sociology and societal evolution, formulating the ecological evolutionary theory that placed societal development and society in general in the context of the broader natural world, integrating it with the broader field of biology. This has been described as majestic analysis and with him as the epitome of the scholar. Until her death in 1994, uh, Jean was a constant companion and intellectual partner for Gary. She contributed to his writing, revised things, and even co-authored uh, multiple editions of his text, Human Societies. They're also partners in activism. Uh, protesting for civil rights, desegregation, and against the Vietnam War. She was a poet who was dedicated to Emily Dickinson, and two volumes of her poetry are out in the world, one of which said to be posthumous. She wrote of her poetry, even as my children were formed as embryos, my powers and laws not mine, so my poems are products formed within, not of me. I have to hurry, hence run dry, and I have so much to say. Along the way in their journey as academics, as activists, as writers, they had multiple F1 hybrids. First Jean, then Robert, then Catherine. And then in 1956, Gerhard got a very special present on his 32nd birthday. They do share the same birthday. This being the man of the hour, Richard Niemer and Plinsky, pictured here with uh, his middle namesake. Those who wondered where that middle name came from, right there. Now, I tried researching this, and the records are sparse. I'm still not certain. There is some possibility that he may or may not have been this. He grew up in Michigan and then North Carolina. He's interested in sports, but he showed no E.O. Wilson-like early proclivities for natural history, possibly because he was too busy tormenting other Mr. Wilsons. <laughs> um, he wasn't really oriented towards science uh, or biology despite his mother's efforts until he went to Oberlin College, where he originally intended to major in government. Uh, but then he took a non-majors biology course that really spoke to him in a way that government courses did not. And this is a fundamental lesson. Good non-majors courses are important because you never know who they might inspire. This course led to three other significant ones. An ecology course taught by David Egloff, Evolution, taught by James Stewart, where he learned from the text uh, Population, Species, and Evolution by Ernst Meyer, which is fantastic. And Lauren Isley is just a majestic Darwin century, which really sets uh, Darwin's ideas and discoveries in science within the broader context of the ferment of the intellectual life of the 19th century. It's really wonderful. If you haven't read it, you really should. And then Molecular Genetics, taught by Dick Levin where the text was uh, Gunther Stentz's Molecular Genetics, an introductory narrative, which really went into the development of molecular genetics, focusing on the motivations of the central figures, the honing of sharp questions, and the elegant design of critical experiments that led to massive discoveries. And it really introduced Rich to how useful uh, microbes can be in fundamental questions, kind of like the Malthus of, of, of Rich's story. Imagine it was also quite a well-written book, if nothing else given the title of Stent's um, memoirs, Nazis, Women, and Molecular Biology, <laughs> Memoirs of a Lucky Self-Hater. <laughs> at length, Rich went to grad school at UNC Chapel Hill, where he was mentored by Nelson Kirsten Sr. Um, 
That's a junior. Oh, okay. Imagine him, but different. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it came up on an image search of senior. Oh, well. <laughs> he was a very important and significant ecologist, a co formulator of uh, the scientific version of Aldo Leopold's concept of the tropic cascade. And he formulated or helped to formulate the green world hypothesis that holds that predators allow plants to thrive by keeping herbivores in check. He was also part of a group of ecologists who were calling for ecology to really grow up and get past observational and correlational studies to stop just describing what the world was like and get at how the world actually works. He stressed critically the need for ecological studies to include controlled experiments to actually test the hypotheses that came from field studies, and he insisted that Rich's PhD work exemplify this. And so, much like Darwin, Rich's career started out with beetles, though not the music, uh, musical kinds. Uh, these were predatory southern ground beetles, uh, primarily of the genus Carabas, and he carried out a series of studies on the effects of clear cutting on the diversity, abundance, and body mass of these beetles, working on Rich Mountain and Little Waterstock Mountain in Macon County, North Carolina, where he got to see views like these that are very different from the ones he gets to see out of his office today. <laughs> this work involved very careful, quantitative uh, field observations in uncut versus clear-cut forest areas, formulations of hypotheses based on those observations, and then careful field experiments to test those hypotheses and tease out the effects of different factors that he noted. This work involved months of daily hikes Field sites to check pit traps, the girls of rain, storm, heat, venomous snakes, as I can attest, there are plenty of in those mountains, especially copperheads, which he killed a fair number of. Uh, he was later quoted as saying, despite the pleasures of working outdoors, the research was slow. Heavy rains often drowned the beetles in my pitfall traps, and it was difficult to imagine feasible experiments that would really test the scientific ideas that most excited me. In short, he realized he was not a field ecologist. <laughs> he really wanted some way of getting at questions with more precision and control. And his interests have really been changing due to uh, long, often late night, probably slightly drunken discussions with the service and others, sometimes over games of Pac-Man, I'm told. Um, and also coursework. In specific, a very critical one in 1979, Ecological genetics, uh, at, uh, a course at Duke University taught by Giannis Antonovics, that emphasize selection and adaptation are processes that take place within an ecological context, and that evolutionary change and ecology feed back into each other. Moreover, ecological and evolutionary, uh, ecology and evolution and ecological phenomena are ultimately based in genetics, in ecological change and genetic change. Adaptation then is not simply a matching of organisms to the environment, but something that's dynamic, definable, and quantifiable. One of Rich's favorite quotes, because he brings it up often, comes from Antinovics. The distinction between ecological time and evolutionary time is artificial and misleading. Changes of both kinds may be on any time scale. Frequently, genetic and ecological changes are simultaneous. There's a lot encapsulated in Ecology and evolution are really one thing. You can just imagine this echoing through his brain like a bell pole. And his discussions with Phil Service came to incorporate the theme of how to integrate ecology and evolution uh, going forward in their future work. Plus, he'd already done experiments with ecology, so why not experiments with evolution? And he tried it in the field, finding that field evolution experiments are really hard to get to work. So what about a lab model? Service decided to go and play with fruit flies, Rich decided to go somewhere else. His mind started going to other places, in specific back to that molecular genetics course at, at, at Overland. He recalled that seminal work that he learned about done in molecular genetics using bacteria and viruses, how, how valuable they proved, how great those experiments were. And he remembered and reread his Otto Lurie book, 1943, his all time favorite experiment. He thought, what about bacteria as well? They began reading the then rather paltry uh, literature uh, it, it, dealing with this, there were very few re researchers at the time, among them Gary Hall, Dan Dykhausen, and Bruce Levin. And so, 
as it happened, he discovered Lebanon all 1977, and he was everything he wanted. It was revelatory. And so he sat down and he wrote a letter, which he wrote, it strikes me that E. coli is well suited for experimental investigations into many aspects of ecological genetics. My only experience with E. coli was an undergraduate at Oberlin College when I took a course in microbial genetics. Hence, a postdoctoral position will be necessary for me to pursue research in this direction. Therefore, I'm writing to find out if you would be interested in considering me for a postdoc. Well, that letter led to an invitation to visit, and the visit then to an offer for a position. And uh, so, Rich wrapped things up in North Carolina and prepared to move. Now, as a letter from Bruce notes, it was not just him moving. Uh, during his time at UNC, he had met the, the lovely, magical Madeline uh, Honig, the daughter of two brilliant academics, about whom I'm not allowed to say because it's not Madeline's day, I'm told. Um, <laughs> at a Halloween party where they were rearing things I'm not allowed to uh, talk about either. And they fell in love, married, and in 1981 they had their first child, Daniel. Um, it, you, you get a sense of Bruce's sense of humor here, noting that this demonstrated that even ecologists can do genetics. <laughs> Incidentally, given their backgrounds, Linsky, uh, Honig, F1s, They've got to be incredible. Keep an eye on Shoshana. She's got a look that says she's done on world domination. <laughs> uh, Bruce later said, it was a joy to work with Richard. Three plus years of the most delicious scientific arguments. <laughs> As Rich came in, Bruce and company taught him all there was to know about the work, and he rapidly got up to speed on the basics of microbiology, and he rapidly fell in love with the immediate feedback of the work, the sharp logic, the inference involved in all of that. And importantly, he saw how in bacteria, ecology and evolution really are extremely tightly linked. His work focused on the coevolution of E. coli and phage. So allowed evolutionary hypotheses and coevolutionary arms races like the Red Queen hypothesis to be studied in ways that were not possible in the field. Moreover, these systems were simple enough to develop mathematical models from which predictions could be brought forth that could then be tested with experiments, leading to findings that were generalizable across all of life. In short, it was tailor-made for rich to love, and set course for all the, uh, that would follow. This work was excellent, of course, because he's not capable of anything else. And it culminated in a manuscript published in the American Naturalist. This won the prestigious 1985 uh, ASM Presidential Award for the best manuscript published in the journal. And Bruce later noted that this kind of signal that ecological and evolutionary studies with bacteria were becoming legitimate. <laughs> he began looking for jobs in 1983, sending out 75 applications, which brought one interview and no offers. And he actually considered becoming an actuary, meaning that science almost lost a great figure to the world's most boring job. <laughs> but in 1984, Luckily, he got an, uh, an offer from uh, UC Irvine not long after the birth of Shoshana. He accepted, deferring a year to continue his work on bacteriophage coevolution, as well as becoming interested in examining possible uh, ecological and evolutionary consequences of releasing genetically engineered organisms into the world. He moved to Irvine in 1985 with his growing family and set up a very tiny lab by comparison to now bringing in students and postdocs, began work on, among other projects, the pleiotropic and epistatic effects of virus resistance in E. coli. And then, in 1985, Francisco Ayala, a fellow member of the faculty there, came to him and asked him for his thoughts on the really intriguing new paper that had been published recently in Nature. And it really set the stage for Rich's first impression of fame in the evolutionary biology. This paper was Cairns et al. 1988, The Origin of Mutants, in which uh, they wrote, the main purpose of this paper is to show how insecure is our belief in the spontaneity or randomness of most mutations. It seems to be a doctrine that has never been properly put to the test. We describe here a few experiments and some circumstantial evidence suggesting that bacteria can choose which mutations they should produce. Their data were essentially that they had done fluctuation tests and seen distributions of lac plus mutants among lac minus uh, E. coli uh, due to a frame shift mutation that were uh, beyond what Lurie and Delbert would predict and were really at odds 
with random mutation on these lactose plates and played it on. Moreover, they saw that lactose mutants accumulated over time with selection, which didn't seem probably Darwinian to them, so they didn't think further than that. It's one of a number of papers that came out around that time over the next few years by Cairns, by Hall, by Patricia Foster, and others that all presented very similar data and conclusions in favor of this idea of directed mutation, with this concept that bacteria can preferentially generate beneficial mutations in response to selective pressures. The number even purported to find that non-selective form mutations occurred very rarely relative to selective ones. Lurian, Del Brooklyn, and Trouble. Revolutionary findings these would be. If microbes are different, have great ramifications, and we mean among other things, microbial evolution experiments really aren't a viable way to approach uh, evolution the way they were thought to be, if correct. And that's a really big deal. And that occurs to Rich. He was perturbed. The authors seemed to jump from limited data to non-Darwinian explanations without passing them. And they seem to have forgotten that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and much sharper than they were showing. Moreover, they presented no viable mechanisms for how this was happening. And so Rich, with uh, Ayala and Montgomery Slatton, published a few letters uh, uh, over the next year or so, presenting alternate but Darwinian hypotheses that would explain uh, what had been observed, proposing models that would make sense of these data in ways that were not just ridiculous. Uh, he continued working on this for a number of years, posing new models, uh, countering new claims by the direct mutation community, uh, and working with his grad student, John Mittler, to do experiments to test alternate Darwinian models and explanations. I'm told that Mittler did the, the lion's share of this while Rich kind of sat back and directed. Uh, it turns out... Directed evolution. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it turns out, they, they found, that what Cairns and others were seeing really could be explained under Darwinian terms. And the papers that came out of this are just absolute classics. They, they're really constituting a master class in how to properly formulate and test shark hypothesis. In, order, in, in other words, how to do really good science. And this was a sustained barrage, not simply from, from Rich and John, but also many others, including John Rump, and it had an effect. Despite the uh, uh, efforts, strong efforts, some of them still ongoing, strangely, of the directed mutation components, including work done in Paul's lab that featured these famous F FL, or Bleep Linsky lines, uh, that effectively kill uh, directed mutations occurrence in evolution, thus making it safe for microbes to still be used as models for understanding evolution. And this was good, because Rich was busy during this time with other stuff. He was, in fact, coming up with another project. They got thinking about long-term evolution experiments. And I have a feeling that this was partly due to the fact that one of his colleagues at UC Irvine was Michael Rose, who had been carrying out a long-term evolution experiment with Drosophilus since 1981. And if this can be done with flies, ridiculous things they are, why not bacteria? And, you know, serial transfer is really the simplest procedure in microbiology. Uh, what if you did one of those, then another, then another? What if you didn't stop? They thought about doing an experiment like this, and then he was thought to be crazy. This was exploratory. There were no real hypotheses, no point. Why bother? It's just stupid. <laughs> but he did it anyway. <laughs> And in early, 19, in, in, in early 1988, he plated two cultures of E. coli B, one RL606, that was Aerobinus, and its Aeroplus brethren, RL607. He grew them overnight, and the next day, <coughs> six random Aerobinus colonies and uh, six random Aeroplus colonies, and used them each to inoculate a population. So, he had 12 populations that were to be evolved in a mineral glucose medium called DM25. There would have been many more, he tells me, if there had been more incubator space in the room. He's rather glad there wasn't. <laughs> well, it's enough. <laughs> and this came along not, at, not long uh, after Madeline gave birth to their second daughter, Natalie, which should make two points. Number one, the same time he was overseeing the origins of groundbreaking science, and this is true throughout his career, he was being a good father to a growing family. 
And also, it means that soon after the birth of his last child, he began a very long-term affair. Uh, but Madeline knows about it, so it's okay. <laughs> so, he had these 12 populations, and they have since, with some uh, irregularities, been involved under a daily 100-fold serial transfer regime of indefinite, and we can say firmly now it is indefinite, duration, under which each population undergoes about 6.64 generations per day. Originally, samples were frozen every 100 generations, later 500 generations, producing a viable frozen fossil record of the entire experiment, going back to the beginning, that's provided an incredible resource for evolution. It's a highly simplified system. There's no sex, no recombination, no gene flow, no invasions, no environmental change, no asteroid strikes. It's all simplified. It's evolution purely by the action of mutation, natural selection, and genetic drift. But because it's simple, it's very powerful. It had three original goals. One, to measure the dynamics of evolution, getting into questions like how fast do the populations evolve? What's the rate of evolutionary change? Is there a limit? Does the rate change? Uh, to examine the relationships of the dynamics between the phenotypic and genotypic change, which is a bold idea at a time when sequencing was in its infancy. Do the same phenotypic changes always spring from the same genetic changes, for instance? Do genotype and phenotype change in concert? Finally, to examine the repeatability of evolution. So it's like running the same experiment 12 times simultaneously from the same genetic point under the same conditions. So under, doing this, do they all evolve the same way? Do they do wildly different things? By August 1989, the first manuscript was ready. A lot of work had gone into it. It was ready for submission. They sent it to American Naturalists. The first review back was positive but honest, with detailed suggestions and questions, starting, this work should be of interest to all interested in the genetic basis of adaptation and should convince many evolutionists of the versatility of microbial systems for studies in experimental evolution. It was really everything that the review should be. And a true mensch, the reviewer even gave his name. It was Fred Cohen. And as an admirer of Fred's, I was just thrilled to find that out. Then there was reviewer two, <laughs> which began, this paper has merit and no errors, but I do not like it and do not think it appropriate for the American I feel like a professor giving a poor grade to a good student. <laughs> Going on, a lot of work went into this paper. NIH will want evidence of accomplishment before reviewing the grant. Thus, even though the experiment's incomplete and the paper seriously premature, publication of a significant result is required. As if basic research produces significant results like gene increases in cars. I hope that we will be able to maintain better quality control than GM. It's worse. I'm upset with the paper because it relies heavily on statistics. I'm upset because continued reliance on statistics and untested models by population geneticists will only hasten the demise of the field. Molecular biology has created a revolution in the way biology is done. While their experimental methodology cannot be used for all fields all the time, it should be used whenever possible because molecular biologists control the funding and most of the faculty employees. <laughs> this guy had some negative issues with molecular biologists. Rich is a very diplomatic person to a degree. His response began, it's hard to know how to respond to this review, which seems more emotional than rational. <laughs> Possibly he was also drunken. Uh, does this reviewer offer molecular biology as a field to be emulated for its rigor? If so, then why does the reviewer belittle statistical analyses and theoretical models, which introduce tremendous rigor into the scientific process? The logic escapes us as to how work such as ours could hasten the demise of the field of population genetics. Uh, by, uh, by its continued reliance on statistics and untested models. Quite the contrary, we believe that the field of population genetics is healthy and that the development of theoretical models and the statistical analysis of experimental data are critical parts of the scientific method. The paper was accepted. 
It was published in December 1991, and surely to the result of an apoplectic attack by her fever two. <laughs> if you want to know who it was, you probably need to look for whoever died suddenly in December 1991. <laughs> um, it, was, it actually won the 1991 Presidential Award from ASN for Best Paper Appearing in the Journal. As far as I know, Rich is the only person to do this twice. So that was the first paper in the long-term experiment, but it certainly was not the last. At least one paper has appeared every year since 1994, and typically more than that. I note that this suspiciously aligns with him coming to MSU to become Anna Professor, and I wonder if this is a coincidence. Just think that Michigan State. Uh, there are dozens of papers at this point, and I want to note, this, paper, this chart is not exhaustive. Uh, I was mainly going on which ones he has his name on, but there are many, many others, so this is an underestimate, um, probably just went to three. And this literature is really a testament to the value of the long-term evolution experiment, which has long since outgrown its original goals. And it's proven remarkably flexible. It's allowed the examination of questions originally thought unanswerable, ones that didn't even occur to people, or else has examined questions in fundamentally new ways, like correlated responses, like punctuated evolution, the roles of adaptation, chance and history of evolution, the origins of ecological specialization, parallel genetic evolution. Plus, it has shown that one of the virtues of long-term evolution experiments is it gives time for technological and conceptual advancement to occur, so that new questions can arise and new ways of addressing them can also arise. And Rich has embraced this added value. And so uh, we see things like him uh, uh, using uh, gene expression studies to study the evolution, and of course, genome sequencing. Even high throughput metagenome sequencing, and Michael Desai will present on this later with data doing deep sequencing of all 12 lines that is really mind blowing and kind of sets the terms for probably decades of work to come. So stay tuned. It's also turned out previously unsuspected, unknown aspects of the dynamics of evolution, like the fact that fitness can increase indefinitely in a constant environment, and then it does so according to a simple power law. It's also shown that fitness change and genomic change interact in ways that are counterintuitive and certainly not in lockstep. Also, time gives the opportunity for new phenomena to arise, expanding what can then be studied by the experiment, like the mutator phenotypes, their dynamics, and how they can be compensated for, uh, the origins and maintenance of diversity in an experiment that was intended to exclude ecology. And really, the LTE is testament to the fact that life affords simplicity and always finds a way to complexify things. But this is a fundamental about life that the long term is really espoused. Also, novel traits like SIP plus can arise, giving opportunity to study things like historical contingency, the origins of evolutionary novelty, and even speciation, as well as providing ecological opportunity for weirdos who like to stack things, <laughs> whoever that may be. The experiment's now gone on for over 28 years, over 65,000 generations. It's celebrated around the world when significant milestones are reached. It's difficult to summarize, probably impossible, at least in a short period of time, certainly not in an hour, the value and the legacy of this experiment. And it's continuing to grow, gathering new workers, attracting new researchers, and being used to go after new and better questions. It's shown definitively that experimental evolution is not simply a valuable way to approach evolution, but a critical way to approach it. It's legitimized and revolutionized experimental microbial evolution in ways not thought possible 30 years ago. But along the way, he's been doing other things. He was awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant in 1996, got named to the National Academy of Sciences in 2006, got involved with Avita thanks to Chris Adami, and helped to garner interest in digital evolution studies that, and, and Avita was so attractive, they even considered ending the long-term evolution experiment for a time, and thankfully, inertia won out, so it continued. <laughs> and he published dozens of papers on work not dealing with the long-term experiment. The guy has 241 publications listed. It's just incredible, incredibly humbling. Now, this is not even going to end to his work uh, in the investigation to find the uh, anthrax attacker. And all of that work on the experiment, of course, has involved not just Rich. He's a god, but not that much of one. 
It's about the talent, the toil, time, sweat, skill of managers and techs like Nirja, uh, who is a goddess herself. Uh, and it wouldn't have been possible without her. And this highlights Rich's ability to identify talented individuals, to bring them in, and to keep them happy and working. Also, it's been the product of the work of literally dozens, if not a hundred at this point, undergrads, grad students, and postdocs that Rich has mentored. And he really is a fantastic mentor. I can say that myself. He grants plenty of freedom. And while he's always there uh, to make time to help us with problems, for the most part, he leaves us alone to pursue our own directions. He's kind, he's humane, and he's decent, even fatherly to us. He's ready to inspire, to encourage, bad times, even to offer a sympathetic hug in times of tragedy or loss. He's taught us to think better, more logically, to see farther than we did before, to do fundamentally better science, to not be tripped up by our pride, but to be humble before the evidence, the phenomena we study, to not take ourselves too seriously. I can't express how important it is that he's self-deprecating and goofy. That's just, that's, that's important for someone as brilliant as he is. Uh, he also inculcates enthusiasm and childlike glee in us about the wonderful things that we study. We are kids getting to play with really great toys, and he really makes us realize that. I had a, a recent friend ask me, what is Lindsay like? I never hear anything about him aside from the general vibe of all I did today. <laughs> and I had to tell her, think of Einstein crossing this <laughs> <laughs> and part of that mentoring has involved uh, teaching us to be better writers. Rich is an excellent writer. Uh, he insists on clarity, on laying out sharp hypotheses, uh, and good experimental logic. And there's a clear influence of Larry and Bill Brook uh, in the early papers in molecular biology in those. His papers are typically incisive and elegant and read far better than those scientific papers, meaning, of course, they're actually readable. But writing a paper with Rich can be incredibly humbling. When I first came to the lab, Chris Borland taught me uh, about the magic red tide that sweeps over drafts, sweeping away all that is bad and leaving only excellence behind. And I got a <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a rich edit of a draft I sent him of a 2008 contingency paper that was actually my book. <laughs> Uh, th this shows that in the Linsky lab, you learn to be a better writer out of a sense of self-preservation. <laughs> so, what can we sum him up as? What's his legacy meaning of place in science? Well, I would say for one thing, by spearheading the attack uh, on, uh, on direct mutation, he blunted uh, what could have been a very dangerous and destructive long term for understanding microbial evolution. Also, he's been a key figure in the growing community of experimental evolution. He's gregarious and friendly. This has led to the accumulation of an enormous network of collaborators and co-authors. He's even introduced many of them to experimental evolution. He's introduced other researchers to other researchers, forming collaborations that wouldn't have taken place otherwise. So he's been a nexus and a nucleation point, both primary and secondary, of a growing community of researchers uh, and Beacon is sort of an example. He helped with the founding of that. And it's important because key figures really leave their stamp on the field. You can see this with James Watson in molecular biology, if you will. Well. But I doubt that experimental level, microbial evolution would be quite as collegial and friendly without which involved. And as for the long term experiment, that really, in many ways, is where his legacy lies. The world's simplest experiment is now an icon become a resource for scientists that will be studied for decades, if not centuries, to come. It will be a platform for great science discoveries far into the future. But it doesn't stop there. The long-term experiment's been reported on extensively in popular press. It's been discussed on the web, described in textbooks, discussed in classes, written about in popular science books by Richard Dawkins, by Carl Zimmer, and many others. Its findings have been a key part of testimony in trials to keep creation of some out of the public schools been discussed by philosophers and even in legislative debates around the country. The long-term experiment has become one of the public bases of evolution, much like the uh, Darwin Pinches and Galapagos. Marina Malley in Philosophy of Microbiology kind of sums it up, writing, the name many people associate now with experimental evolution is that of Richard Lipsky. 
His research from 1988 until now and tens of thousands of generations of E. coli has been the source of many profound insights into the evolutionary process of theory. Very seldom is it qualified as providing merely prokaryotic insight. It has generated better understanding of the vulnerability, hypermutation, the interplay of neutral and adaptive evolutionary processes, convergence, and kin selection. Overall, Linsky's long-running experiment shows great potential for bridging the gap between microevolution and macroevolution, and inspired and contributed to a huge range of additional experimental and other work. An actual evolutionary biologist who will go unnamed, but may or may not be Jonathan Lasso's, uh, told me, <laughs> Rich has shown how important questions can be addressed in, my, in model microbial systems in ways that have relevance to the field as a whole, rather than just telling us something about how microbes function and evolve. Moreover, he's shown how previously intractable questions can actually be studied experimentally. In a very related way, he's been instrumental in showing the importance of experiments to test outstanding questions about evolution. More recently, of course, the availability of genomic data has made the work even more multifaceted and valuable. And I think Rich foresaw that, at least to some extent, way back then. Toward the end of his life, Paul Dane wrote, I'm a part of nature. And like other natural objects, from a lightning flash to a mountain range, I shall last out my time and then finish. This prospect does not worry me, because some of my work will not die when I do so. That's certainly true of Rich, and more besides just because just as the case is with Paul Dane, it's not simply his work. It's the people he touched, the dozens of people that he guided, of the postdocs and grad students, the undergrads that he's taught over the years, that at this point include great luminaries of experimental microbial evolution. Hilaria Souza, Mike Travisano, Paul friggin' Turner, <laughs> <laughs> Justin Meyer, others. It's just incredible. A line occurred to me from Ulysses. I'm a part of all I have met, the elderly king said. He was so great that he did not take away from his experiences. His experiences took away from him. Rich is a part of all of us who have studied with him. And really, in many ways, that is his great legacy and meaning. And so with that said, I would like to ask all those who are current uh, grad students or postdocs of Bridges, please stand up. The past ones, please stand. Those who have written papers with him. Those who have learned from him and been inspired by him. <laughs> Your meaning and your legacy is all around you. Happy birthday.